a different point. We really appreciate, appreciate you joining us. Um, so as Jesse shared, my name is Vanessa, I also go by Vanessa Michelle, she, her, hers. I'm the program director for our Healing Harms Department. I've been with CCJ, just celebrated my five-year anniversary uh, earlier this month. And um, wanted to just take a moment to give a little bit of background. Um, so our department was born back in 2013. Um, we've, we've transitioned different program titles, but Healing Harms is really what's felt right at this point. Um, our program is, is really anchored in recognizing harms, recognizing harms that are happening at an interpersonal level, group level, systemic level, historical level, and how are we bringing in the discipline of restorative justice? How are we bringing in different healing modalities? How are we in invoking and creating space for community liberation and community healing to happen um, through a platform like community organization? Um, and so, Healing Harms um, is, is working with families, we're working with youth, we're working with community groups and workplace environments. Um, our program initi initially was most recognized with our juvenile diversion program. And so for folks who might be familiar with restorative justice, it is an alternative to punitive systems, right? And it is looking at relationships, it's repairing harm, and it is bringing an opportunity for more holistic responses and more nuanced responses to why violence and harm is happening um, and why an incident might have occurred, right? And what are some of the ways that we wanna make things right, that we want to uh, bring justice and healing in a way that feels meaningful for all who have been impacted. Um, and so our juvenile diversion program was a, a really huge milestone for our organization and frankly for LA County at large. There are other organizations in, in LA and throughout the country, frankly global at this point, who are also doing juvenile diversion work. We also have organizations in the country that do adult diversion. And this is taking a, a criminal charge out of the hands of the system, out of the hands of police, out of the hands of probation, district attorneys, and again, bringing it into a community environment where folks can come together and over a series of prep and together. Um, over the years, again, seven years we've been doing this work, we now have expanded to be just as responsive with family harm. We don't need to wait until there's an act of criminal charge. We don't need a system to tell us that we need help or that we need support. Families and community members are able to access us to, um, to activate restorative practices as a preventative um, tool as well. And then the third uh, program pathway that we've grown over the years is our restorative practices in the workplace, group environments. We call that SCORE, Strengthening uh, Organizations. And it's a very long title, but SCORE is our, is our acronym. So check that out on our website. Um, we integrate community members to be volunteers on the program. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. And I just want to acknowledge too that restorative justice is, is not new, right? CCJ did not create this field of restorative justice. And frankly, over the last few decades of restorative justice building um, recognition, building funding, getting funded throughout the country and globe, there's, there's history that draws back from the beginning of, of communities, right? From indigenous practices, from especially this land of Southern California. There are communities, native folks who have been um, who have normalized this culture of coming together when harm has happened. And so, you know, there's also a complicated history with RJ that on the future. So I'm going to, I'm going to pass the, pass the mic over um, and invite my, my coworkers and our volunteer leader to share a little bit about their experience, what brought them to the work, um, and whatever else they want to share. So I'm going to pass it to Bex, if you want to go ahead and kick us off. Thanks, V. Hi, everyone. My name is Bex. My pronouns are she, her, her. Here are my keys. I like wish those weren't there, but <laughs> there they are. <laughs> 
Um, so I started as a volunteer with CCJ back around, I think it was like mid 2016 um, and was there for a couple of years up until I left for grad school. But that's really like that moment where I began as a volunteer was when I started in this restorative justice work with families and youth with CCJ in particular, right? So left to grad school, I was in Michigan for a little bit and moved back and just the universe, I don't know, everything in my life kind of feels like it just led up to this point where I was able to join my team again at CCJ now as a staff member. So that feels really exciting for me. And maybe for me just to speak on like what brings me to this work, I think just seeing the hope and possibility of like helping folks or supporting for folks to deal with really difficult, challenging, painful situations um, and conflicts, but without labeling and criminalizing folks. And, you know, I work a lot with youth, so without labeling or criminalizing youth, um, but rather really understanding, like V had already started sharing that harm and conflict are really complex, that there are so many reasons and roots like underneath something that happened at both, you know, interpersonal levels, like one-on-one -on -one levels within ourselves, but also always there's systemic, big society things that are connected, right, to the harms and conflicts that we see. So I really just am grateful for this opportunity to continue my lifelong learning and how can we really support folks through this. Um, always believing that people can transform and also honoring the, the needs and, and the impact of people who are harmed as well. And like, so their healing journey as well. Um, so I just really love to, when I'm working with youth, like getting to just witness them having like an epiphany or having like a different, like a, in that live moment transformation of how they've like, how they're seeing something that happened to them or like, them sharing their lived experience with me. I think I really want to honor that that's just a big piece of our work, really sitting with youth and listening to youth. Um, and so I also really love in those moments and working with families as well, just witnessing that we can really develop and strengthen different ways of relating to each other and different ways of navigating conflict like that don't cause more harm to folks, um, either by systems or even interrelationally within ourselves and within our communities. So, yep, I will pass it off to Ali. Yeah, hey everybody, uh, Ali, uh, full name is Alejandro Hazard with just he, him with CCJ. And yeah, I mean, what brings me to the work and I feel like, it, yeah, I've been here as well for four years now, going on five soon. And I mean, how I got started in the work is I came as, as, a, as a trained mediator, actually. And that's actually where I got my background and start. Um, did grad school, did, did that pathway. And it was something that I was always interested in and wanted to be a part of. And at the time, it wasn't working out. And I actually had to leave and go and be a paralegal for a while to get some more experience. But similar to Vex, like everything aligned. And I was very fortunate that I had applied for CCEJ and they said yes. And I was very lucky to join an organization where I could actually do this and be passionate about something that I do. And I've been here ever since. And I'm very fortunate to be a part of this team. Uh, for me, it's, especially as a mediator, like, and having that background, I think the difference between mediation and RJ has been, like, you can be more holistic and have more possibilities and more creativity in a restorative justice process than just mediation and having maybe one or two, two or three parties as part of a dispute. And I think that restorative justice for me has been more, I, it, it's given me more possibilities, to, again, to be creative, to really work with families, work with young people in crisis, and have a space where, and I think for me, what I love about, especially having this experience and being here, is having a space where people feel heard and where young people, where their parents, their caregivers can really have a space to dialogue and talk about what's going on. And I think what I'm grateful for for this 
this team and this organization is that, you know, I think in our everyday lives, we're always so busy and we're doing everything that we can to survive, to stay afloat. And we having a space like ours where we can take a moment to pause, dialogue, talk about what's going on and, and feel heard. And I mean, I've sat across from young people and their parents, they can really have a moment to talk. And this is what I'm feeling. And then for us also to talk about larger systems and things that are going on. More often than not, we receive young people at a challenging time where there are larger forces at work, systems of oppression that uh, are going on as well. And we have a space where we can talk about things that are going on and have a space to talk about accountability, but then also like, what can we do to also really talk about um, how do we navigate this, the life that we lead together? And have that space. So I'm super fortunate to be here and continue to be part of this team and this program. And, and I will go ahead and then pass it on to Yaz. Hi, everyone. So I'm Yaz. Uh, my pronouns are she, hers. Um, and so uh, where do I start? And so my background, <laughs> it's like crazy how I've gotten here. Um, because restorative justice wasn't something that I just, I knew about, you know, years ago when I started my education. So education is in psychology and I went um, to grad school for clinical mental health counseling. Um, and so I started off um, working in schools really. Um, well, really I started working off in group homes before I went to grad school and then I made my way to schools. And so um, I wanted to work with kids. I knew that for sure, um, just because, you know, there's been so many adults in my life um, that have guided me to even get to where I am today. And so I kind of wanted to be that for someone else. And so I felt like schools was the way to go. So, you know, I started working in schools. My first school that I worked in was in New York, actually, um, in Staten Island, and then uh, moved my way up, up to the Bronx um, in New York City. And so that's where I was introduced into restorative justice. Um, and so it was, you know, doing restorative justice seemed, looked a little differently in schools. Um, but what I did appreciate was the opportunity to, for it to be a conversation, um, really intentional and, and really developing actionable ways in which we can resolve conflict. Um, and so, you know, that was interesting. And so um, traveling to the Bronx got a little much for me, so I was living in Brooklyn, and so I was looking for, you know, another job that was a little closer to home, if I'm being honest, um, and so I found my way actually to common justice, and so that is where I really got um, really, like, steeped into, like, uh, the restorative justice world, which has really opened my eyes on, like, the ways in which there are other ways other than punitive measures um, to tackle, you know, the ways that people have harmed people and the things that we've done. Um, and so really what brings me to this work and what keeps me in this work is opportunity. And so the opportunity to be heard um, from both sides, from people who are harmed and the people who have done the harm. Um, I think we underestimate the power of empathy um, and like people who have been harmed, we think that they don't wanna hear, you know, what the other person has to say, but there can be a lot of like, like a lot of growth that happens between that dialogue. Um, in that interaction, and I think that's what it inspires me to stay in that work is just, you know, especially when you think about um, marginalized people, black and brown people, um, and oppressed groups that we just want to be heard. And so what restored justice is, is the opportunity for both parties to be, you know, seen, heard, and then also just provided support and skills to like move forward in the world. And kind of what Beck said is just not to have that stigma associated with them um, and rise above. And so that is what brings me here. And so I will pass it on to Brittany. Hello, everyone. My name is Brittany. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. Um, my background sounds very similar to Yaz's background. Um, I have an undergrad in sociology. I got my master's in social work. I did and do a lot of work with youth uh, birth through transitional age so early 20s um, but that's not why I ended up at CCJ actually <laughs> uh, I, I continue to do work with youth but I in this post BLM world needed a place to channel some energy into the world that I know is possible uh, so many aspects of my identity are constantly under attack by the systems in place 
it, it would be really, really easy for me to just slip into living in a perpetual state of fear and anger, which, you know, those two emotions are absolutely rational uh, and absolutely necessary in times like these. Uh, but I know for myself, I can't stay there. And so in order to get out of that space, I need somewhere to move. I need to move through it and I need some, a target, a goal, something to put that energy towards. Um, I left the country after Trump was elected and I came back. It didn't feel right for us to be gone. Um, so we came back and I landed in Los Angeles. And I'm from Los Angeles area. And then shortly thereafter, I found CCJ just on a, on a whim. We went to Compton Pride, which was the first ever, and we saw the table. And it was the only table that I walked up to the whole time I was there. Um, so both me and my wife got involved pretty quickly. Uh, and then I stuck with it. So I've been with CCJ for a year now um, and volunteering with Healing Harms uh, in addition to some other programs that they have going on. Um, yeah, so that, that's how I got here. Uh, the emotional piece is why I stay here. The, the part about Vanessa Michelle mentioned SCORE and working with organizations. I've experienced a lot of stuff at work uh, in my professional life as a social worker of color. I went to Portland State University and was one of a very few uh, folks of color in my cohort. The, the profession here in Portland, I'm still in, I'm back in Portland now, is very, very white. And I experienced a lot of harm at the hands, quite frankly, of, of white women uh, as my superiors. And by the time I found uh, Healing Harms and CCUJ, I, I really needed to see what else was out there besides just conflict and then nothing. Conflict um, in my direction, for asking for accountability, asking people to do differently and asking for better ways of communication and things like that usually resulted in like people quitting or being fired. Um, and so I needed to see a different way for, for organizations to work through those kinds of dynamics. And I, I went through the training and I specifically asked to work on SCORE opportunities and I was able to do that. I was able to sit in a room with some folks who were dealing with some really rough stuff around racial politics within their organization. Um, and, and being a person who had been in that position, uh, a person of color who who's worked really hard to get to where I am and then be told all of these things that I'm not professional enough because I get a little angry or frustrated. I don't, I have a resting bitch face, whatever the thing is, uh, um, you know, and then be made to feel like my, my feel, I'm just being gaslit left and right. And that was my experience. And so I brought all of that with me into the room and working alongside Vanessa Michelle for that particular stuff. And, you know, as much like that experience helped them as, as much as it helped me. It, it allowed me to see that there are organizations, community-based organizations out there who are willing to do the hard work instead of just go to HR and be like, this person's being insubordinate, let's fire them. And so now that I know that organizations are out there doing this work, it is kind of, not kind of, it has absolutely fueled me for how I present in my workspace. And I will expect nothing less than absolute respect and uh, space for my voice, my experiences. And when I'm asking for accountability, I'm not asking for something I'm not willing to do myself. And that's where I'm at. And I, I, I would have gotten there anyway, but I, I'm really super, super grateful for my time with CCJ. Uh, it helped me get there a lot faster. Uh, I'm learning lessons I think my parents learned later on in life. Um, I'm in my mid-30s now. So I just, I'm very grateful for that opportunity. Uh, to take control of my professional life in a way that I think would have taken me at least another 10 years to do. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> and I, I'm grateful if there were a silver lining for COVID, <laughs> um, is that all of this stuff is online now. So I've been able to continue my involvement with CCEJ, even though I moved in March from uh, Los Angeles back to Portland. I've been able to stay in contact and continue to contribute and grow in RJ, uh, in, in this beautiful community. Thank you. Yes, tossing it back to Vanessa Michelle. Thank you so much. Um, wow, I, first of all, I'm so grateful to my team and um, yeah, and 
Brittany, thank you for taking the time to be with us to also share your experience as a volunteer. Um, just to talk a little more about that volunteer experience. So Brittany is part of a broader team um, that we have an annual training that at this point, there's maybe 30 plus or so uh, community members on a given year. We invite people to, to take a year um, to commit to us and then opt in or out if they, they wanna continue um, after that. And so much of what you are saying, Brittany, is what inspired us in creating the training the way that we did. For folks that say yes to the training, it is not just about, um, you know, what is the, the, what the labor <laughs> that is gonna come out of it as a volunteer. It is truly an invitation for a shift within your own self and within the landscape of your life as well. That is the experience I had about 10 years ago when I was introduced to restorative justice. And that entry point for me was explicitly also about racial justice and was an opportunity for me to step much more deeply in to being an active anti-racist, an active ally, an active co-conspirator, right? Um, as, a, as a woman who identifies as white and European American descent. And so I have a tremendous amount of gratitude to the way restorative justice shifted my relationships at large. Um, and so the, the volunteer training is specifically and intentionally a two month journey. And that is because we think it's kind of difficult to just have an overnight shift, right? Two months with decades worth of life experience is also such a short amount of time. But we ask, ask community members to take two months out of their year and um, over multi weeks, we have about 40 hours worth of training. This year, it's gonna be all virtual. And um, we do skills building. We ask folks to really look at their own life experience to bring into the space. So as Ali said, different than um, mediation training, for example, you're consistently told, you know, you are, um, what is the word? Uh, neutral, <laughs> right? As a circle facilitator, we are not asking you to be neutral. We are asking our community as staff, as volunteers, as people who are participating to truly show up as your like authentic self, as your full self. And we become a better community and society at large when we're being honest about our needs, when we're being honest about what hurts, what makes us upset, right? The full range and spectrum. Um, and when we share, other folks learn through us as well. And so my shirt, which I don't know on the other side of the camera, how if you could read it right, but it says justice for all. And that is one of our taglines at CCJ. And it's important, you know, we're, we're a small team. We can only have so many full-time staff. It is critical that we have a volunteer team that is diverse, that is representing all parts of community so that when we say justice for all, all folks who are participating in our circle work can, can see themselves in people who are also engaged in the circle. So for volunteer training, we're inviting a, a broad range of age, demographics, class background, identities. I mean, the, everything under the sun, everyone is welcome. Um, I also wanna underscore the importance of folks who, are, who have system involvement in their past, right? Formerly incarcerated or other just direct uh, experience, either as a youth or as an adult with how frankly the system um, often falls short, if not, does not meet our goals for justice, right? And so what does it mean to empower us all um, to take care of each other? And it's a responsibility for a full cultural shift. It's not enough to just have a few diversion programs. It's not enough to have a few staff who know how to do this. This, is a, this needs to be an initiative that across the board, everyone has these skill sets, right? And everyone can feel empowered to, to step in and take care of each other um, all the time, especially in these times. And so just a few more things I'll say about the volunteer experience. So when folks graduate from our training program, you're linked up with, with us as staff. Um, you're never asked to do anything solo if you don't want to, but some of our more you know, advanced leaders um, sometimes get, get hired on as consultants to do work. Brittany is one of them. Um, and so you, you join one of the staff members and then we, we literally go on a journey with those participants. We start with an intake, we get clear about what the needs are, the goals, and then over a series of weeks, many times a series of months, we're tapping in and doing intentional prep work, support work 
to guide us to this sometimes life altering moment moment of all coming together for a circle a circle process and it looks different every time right no one circle looks the same we're not doing cookie cutter responses um, this is tailored and customized to what's in front of us so that it's meaningful to those who are participating agreements are created they are co-created they are all consented to and those agreements are detailed they have timelines attached to them um, and at the end of that agreement making process and circle, folks literally sign it off and they say, I will move forward committing to this, right? And then that can be a range of commitments. Um, it depends on what your, your case is, right? Again, we have our diversion case, which is taking legal crimes out of the system. Those cases can range from lower level drug charges um, all the way to, to misdemeanor assaults and frankly, felony level violent crimes. We have cases of home intrusion, cases of sexual harm, um, cases again where there's assault battery that has left uh, very significant physical harm or damage, right? A lot of money sometimes involved in some of the collateral impact of a crime. So the, the agreements that are created for the range in cases are of course also appropriate, right? We're not here to over-program youth. We're not here to put um, consequences on that don't match or don't make sense for the incident. Our focus is about relationships. It's also about accountability. We were saying earlier, um, we are an alternative to this punitive system. That doesn't mean we're not about accountability, right? Harm does happen. Violence exists. How are we doing intervention work that will shift behavioral conditions um, and also asking external systemic conditions to change as well? Um, for our SCORE program, um, there's, also, there's oftentimes policy changes that happen. Brittany acknowledged, like, what does supervisorial um, relationships look like? What are ways that folks are not putting the mirror, shout out behind me, that what are you needing to put the mirror in front of you to really look at what are ways you are creating some, some really unhealthy, toxic environments? And what are some actionable ways that you can change that, right? And there's choicefulness here. Um, in terms of the family intervention work or just community neighbor disputes, um, again, the agreements will really range. Sometimes folks are committing to counseling. Sometimes there's um, substance abuse that needs to get addressed. Um, but there, there's a range. And as Ali said, there's the space for complete creativity. Um, there's tapping into other resources in the, in the community. There's a need for us to have funding throughout the county, not just for our program but for allies and partner organizations that can support families and communities in their in their needs right in the agreement process um, once folks have completed their agreements the case closes out um, and so for those who are with us from a diversion pathway their case closes out and their charger their charges are dismissed and that is a really important piece too we all know the impact and collateral damage that can be lifelong of charges following somebody, sometimes all the way from adolescence to adulthood. We also know, and we have lots of examples throughout history of the ways uh, probation has really has systemic harm on people and the longer term impacts there. So it's really important to us that folks complete successfully, meaningfully, and that there is a dismissal there on their charge. Um, I think that's about covered it. Um, I'd love if Ali, if you could share, where can folks sign up? Um, and then hopefully there's some questions that we can answer. Yeah, definitely. So I'll go ahead and drop in the chat. Definitely. You can go to our website and go to basically our healing harms page. You can get a little bit more information about our program and what we do. So in case you see this entire webinar and you forget everything that was said, you can go see it on our page and get to know our org and get more information about who we are and the things that we do. Um, as well, like I just dropped in the, the chat, uh, a link that directly goes to our upcoming uh, trainings and events and specifically for our volunteer training that's coming up. So you can again, get more information, answer any questions as well. Um, we do for this training have a, a survey monkey sign up so I can also drop that in as well. Um, so you can get some of that. So you can sign up and register. Um, definitely 
complete all of it. So, you know, SurveyMonkey doesn't always save everything. But, uh, and the application deadline is a week from today. So it's October 1st. So definitely get in those registrations and applications. Um, and we would lo we love to have you. So definitely, we want you to be part of this team and um, help us continue the work and change LA County and, and help, um, help our youth and families in Los Angeles. And so, so. Ali, if I could just also share to folks, you're, have, you're welcome to reach out to me directly if you have any questions um, that is on the application as well. My email address is there um, and a phone number too. So happy to talk with folks one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and yeah, thank you for, for everything that folks have shared. I'm seeing startings of questions. I know we only have a few more minutes, um, but one of the questions in the chat is, what are some memorable aha moments that you've seen in circle. So if anyone wants to unmute themselves and share, please do. I want to say, I can't share too much of the details of the case, um, but um, one of the moments um, that I think was really touching, it was actually, um, I was working with the person that was harmed at the time. Um, and we had a circle and I was stepping in um, because he didn't, he chose not to be a part of the circle, which was okay. Um, but one of the things he really want to communicate to the, the person um, responsible was that he wished him nothing but the best. Um, and for me, that is so heartwarming because it was, um, it, I will say it was an assault, right? And he was severely injured, but however, he he just wants the best for that person. And I think it goes to show that, you know, I, I think, you know, we are pretty understanding as human beings if we allow ourselves the opportunity to be, right? If we're giving people the opportunity to really understand where people are coming from. And this particular person was also an immigrant and has been in a, in a detention center before. And he also expressed that he didn't want that person to experience that in his life. Um, and so for his religion, um, he just wanted nothing but the best and just wanted him to continue to move forward in, in his life. And so being true to um, his spirituality and just sending that, that um, their way. And I don't know, for me, it was just empowering and just kind of, we think about punitive um, measures and like punishing people, but I feel there's so many other ways that we can address harm. Um, and we can address it is by loving one another. Um, and so I think that was just representation of that. And so that was heartwarming and, you know, just kind of keeps me staying here in the work. Thank you, Yaz. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I wanted to share maybe really briefly around an experience I had in Circle recently. And like Yaz said, also can't share too many details, but Really, I think an overall impact that I walked away with was witnessing a mother and her son like relating to each other in a way that they hadn't experienced fully outside of that circle. And there was a moment where they both verbalized like, oh, if, if maybe if we give ourselves the opportunity to speak to each other in this way, like that could really impact the way that our relationship has been and it can sort of shift to how they want it to be in the future right which is like we all have shared like being seen heard and understood in our relationships um, with the folks that are the closest to us so that was a really beautiful moment um to witness between them and just to to see them responding to each other and really listening to to what was alive for them to the feelings that were there and the needs that were there so that was really special for me and a moment that I also want to share, thank you, Yaz, <laughs> or just an experience that I think is really important um, pre-getting to circle is just the walking alongside somebody when they're really trying to do that self-reflection work and shift to a place of, yes, I'm ready to take accountability. Um, I just also love to highlight that because it is a process and it is it is complex and it is hard. And I think sometimes larger systems look at our work and say, oh, that's just so easier. Like 
that's nothing or that's not a real consequence when that accountability, taking accountability is so challenging. And I just want to uplift the work that I see us all doing and youth doing, like really just doing that hard work of reflecting. And when I think that when we just rush to punishment, we don't even give folks the opportunity to engage through that process of really understanding the impact of their actions. Um, and really understanding for themselves, like, what are those needs that I had in that moment? Because those needs are real and those needs are valid, right? Um, the conflict and harm happens when we might respond to those needs or when we try to get our needs met through harmful ways, right? But does it mean that the needs don't matter? So just really wanting to uplift that part too. I'm wondering if anyone wants to take the next question that I saw in here. What are some of our dreams for RJ work in the future, both at CCEJ and general and community? Um, I'll start if that's all right. Um, my family is, was in the process of becoming um, a foster care family here in Portland, and we have since changed our minds after engaging in a lot of the trainings and things and seeing how I mean, I knew internally that the system is and, and it is broken and is working the way it's intended to work. It's intended to disassemble families in so many ways and there's bias there and all those things. Um, we intended to go into this with an RJ mindset, the idea of harm reduction and all of those things. And after this last training this week, I made a decision that that is not where I needed to be um, like to see RJ infused into child welfare in a way that it has yet to be done anywhere that I have been. Um, I am currently engaged in conversations with folks who are in charge of training for the entire state of Oregon. I am going to continue being in conversation with them uh, until they change the wording around uh, race as a special need, um, uh, among many, many other things. Uh, they continually are setting folks up to perpetuate or instill the savior mindset um, and look at folks as broken and, and as deficient in some way that they can't parent their children. Um, and that is just, that's no, way, that's no way to come about bringing families together. There's no healing of harm in that system the way that they do that. Um, I would like to see, I would like to see my, my home state now uh, at least my county do better uh, and and i'm going to continue talking with folks at the state level and pushing for that I can answer this question too um i think i'm also i'm really fortunate in my team i, I do my best to spend a lot of time in coalition spaces and try to also do a lot of outreach as well. I think for me, I mean, just real quick, like what would it look like for the staff of us to double and like have more space and more breath to do the work? What does it mean to, you know, for my dreams for RJ and just the community and for CCJ, like having space to just, you know, to go into coalition spaces and to like help train and facilitate spaces where community, when something happens, like, Community has the answers. Folks in our county, they can, we, they can solve their own problems. We don't need a larger system. And how do we train folks? How do we empower them to do that? How instead, like, do we have RJ practitioners in our communities? Like, how do we assist with that? If you need a space, absolutely, CCJ is here. But like, we don't want to diminish people's power or like, and want to advocate for people. Like, there is a space, but also like, you have that collective wisdom, you have that knowledge. And so for me, it's, it's more than that. It's training, it's having more staff. It's being also, I think for us as an organization, I think we're very fortunate that we're able to assist youth uh, in diversion cases, but I would love to see that much more. I think right now we still only receive a small fraction of, of the young people that are eligible for diversion and how do we continue to advocate and push for young people to have this opportunity versus only a select few. Um, I think, and especially in Long Beach, like Long Beach is our home city. Like I wanna see that more and I wanna see that in DA spaces. I wanna see that in more police departments, like having a space to refer cases to us. 
and having a transformation here that they couldn't get elsewhere. And so I think that's that would be my hope. I want to add one more thing to the dream bucket and then I'm going to close us out. Um, I, yes to everything folks are saying, the other thing that I want to uplift that um, Ali, speaking on some of the coalition spaces that we're in, we're also talking about expanding to adult diversion, right? The, the organization that Yasmin was part of in New York does adult diversion work. And I just, I can't not name that this is as appropriate for youth as it is for adults. And so um, wanting to see the county expand diversion there with adults and also wanting to recognize that that restorative justice is part of a spectrum, a broad spectrum of modalities and possibilities. And for folks who are part of a lot of, of, a lot of conversations happening in 2020 and, and way before, but um, especially in 2020, after restorative justice, there's this tr transformative justice, right? So on that spectrum of liberatory practices, transformative justice is also getting to the place where community are, res are first responders and are funded to do the work um, with each other at large, right? So a dream that um, it's not about diverting cases out of systems, it's about empowering everyone to have the tools to support each other for meaningful uh, intervention, reintegration, uh, prevention, and, and beyond. Um, thank you all so much for, for hanging tight. I know we've gone a bit over time. Um, so I think we'll close up here in terms of our dialogue. If this felt exciting for you, again, please consider joining us as a volunteer. Um, our, our workshop sessions are way deeper dives into the conversations that we've started right now and then of course the skills building component and then finally the actually being on cases themselves so i'm gonna put it back over to you jesse and thank you all so much again for your time and your open mind and heart thank you so much healing harms team beautiful to hear your stories and also um, just really deep and thought-provoking as well. So thanks for your time today. Thanks to everyone for watching. And remember, if you want to support CCJ, you can support us at Long Beach Gives today, but also at our website, www.cacej.org any day of the week. So let's all wave goodbye and I'm going to press stop on the webinar.